Hey, let's, uh, let's try that again, okay? Good morning. That's better. That's better. I want to ask you a question. How many of you were here last Sunday? Raise your hand. Everybody? Okay, good. I'm glad you decided to come back. I want you to know, uh, Tammy and I and, and Beth, we've been working on some things. I'm not going to butcher this service today, hopefully, like I did last week. So it's good to see all of you here. I want to welcome you to this day of worship. Um, I hope that you noticed when you walked in the new murals that are, uh, have been uh, placed on the wall back there. I love them. Uh, they look really great. It's a wonderful welcome when you uh, come into this place to see those. And uh, I think, who all had something to do with that? Uh, was that Melanie? Melanie did it. Melanie, we appreciate you. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, uh, it looks great. It looks great. A wonderful addition to, uh, to this beautiful sanctuary. Uh, I want to let you know that... Um, uh, we are, of course, uh, live streaming on Facebook at this time. We want to welcome those of you who are watching us online. And if you are watching us on our Facebook, Facebook feed, we would like for you uh, to register your attendance. And it's very simple. Just type your name of you and everyone else who's watching with you. Type it in the little comment box that's over on the right. Um, if you'll do that for us, then we'll have a good record of uh, uh, who all is worshiping with us today. And we're glad that you chose uh, to join us. We had, I had my first administrative council meeting uh, with the administrative council of this church this past Thursday night. We did it by Zoom. And uh, I want you to know that when it was over, I'm, I was impressed. I was impressed. This church has a lot going on. Okay. And a lot of good people leading it. And uh, I'm looking forward to what... Uh, uh, to our future and I'm especially ready for this COVID stuff to get out of the way because we've got some things that we're planning and talking about that I think are going to be awesome and so uh, it was a great administrative council meeting and if you get a chance to see uh, those members of our administrative council some of them are here today thank them for the good work that they're doing because they're putting in a lot of time and a lot of effort in helping this to uh, to be a great church. Uh, just one quick announcement. Uh, as you know, our bishop uh, has recommended a book uh, for churches to study. It's called White Fragility. Uh, we're having a book study uh, via Zoom. Uh, it's online, and um, that's on Wednesday nights at 7.30. You're welcome to join in. If you have any more questions about it, you can look in your uh, newsletter. Uh, uh, or you can call the church office. We'll be glad to give you uh, update you on that information. But if you'd like to be a part of that and you're not already a part of it, consider that, uh, adding that to uh, your, your weekly regimen uh, in our spirituality. At this time, uh, I would like for us to join together in a spirit of prayer as we call ourselves to worship. So let's pray together. Almighty God, it is a privilege. It is an honor. It brings joy to our hearts to be able to gather here for worship. We pray that what is done here, all that is said and all the thoughts of our minds, uh, would be pleasing in your sight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening song is There's Within My Heart a Melody. Many of you know this. I want to invite you, if you will, at this time to stand uh, as we join in singing. There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low, fear not I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow, Jesus, 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 sweetest theme I know, fills my heart. Jesus wept across the broken strings, 
Sometimes that path seems rough and steep. See his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Feasting on the riches of his grace, resting beneath the shelter. Thank you and be seated. As we come to this time now in our time of worship, as we turn to our Lord in prayer, we want to lift up the names of uh, loved ones and friends who are in our need to be in our prayers in a special way. As a church family, of course, we want to lift up uh, uh, Paul uh, Cedro and his family. Uh, he lost his brother this week, uh, and so. Uh, uh, they're going to be planning a memorial service for later, and uh, uh, this, uh, uh, his death has touched Paul um, uh, very hard. And, of course, he's not with us today, and we want to lift up him and his family in our prayers, as well as his wife, Kathy. She had cataract surgery this week, is doing well, and so we want to remember her. As we enter into prayer, are there any folks that you would like to mention uh, to be remembered in prayer today? If you would just speak up their, uh, with their names. Okay. Do any of us have any personal needs that we would like to especially lift up to God? If, you, if that might be the case, you can simply raise your hand if you'd like. And uh, we're all going to turn to God now in prayer. So let's pray together. Almighty God, you are the God of our past. You are the God of our present. You are the God of our future. In these moments of prayer, we give you thanks for the past and all the ways we've experienced your blessings, your grace and your love in our lives. We give you thanks for all the ways you have been there for us and strengthen us through the power of your spirit and your presence. We praise you today as the God of the present, bringing us together here for Worship, not only in this sanctuary, but in our living rooms, and our dining rooms at home. We thank you for the opportunity to offer to you our praise and our thanksgiving. We thank you for the opportunity today to, to bring glory and honor to your kingdom, to gather together as a family of faith. It is a blessing in our lives. And Almighty God, as we come to you in prayer, we lift up to you the days that are ahead. In the midst of this pandemic, we pray that we would find strength and comfort and peace and that your healing power and your healing presence would get us past all of this, back to the life that we love to live. We lift up to you today those we've mentioned here. We pray that in these next few days, in their futures, that they would experience your healing power in your presence, your comfort, and your peace in a way as only you can provide it. In these moments, we thank you again for being that God of our past. For being the God of our present here in worship. For 
being the God of the future in the lives of all of your children. And today as we gather for worship, as we pray to you, we realize that it took the sacrifice of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ to bring us into a right relationship with you. We pray, O oh God, that you would help us to always focus our minds and focus our spirits on what we have received from Christ. That you would help us to focus our minds on what it means to be a disciple of Christ. That you would focus our minds on what it means to serve Christ as he has served us. We thank you that through him our sins are forgiven, that we can live with the promise each and every day of eternal life. It's the greatest gift we know in our lives of faith. As we thank you for this gift, we choose now to follow Christ's example in prayer. We pray in the way that he taught us to pray when he said these words, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, as we gather for worship, one of the great opportunities that is presented to us is the opportunity to give back to God from what God has given to us. And we're going to do that at this time. You can remain seated, but we're going to be singing an offertory song, a wonderful song called Sweet, Sweet Spirit. We're going to sing through it twice. And as we sing this song, if you have not already done so and would like to leave a gift, uh, your gift to the church here in the offering on the altar, we also have an offering plate in the rear. We invite you to do so at this time. Uh, with God's spirit and uh, uh, our commitment to giving, uh, first and foremost in our minds, let us now sing our offertory, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There
Reading from Book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. So there now isn't any condemnation from those who are Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. God has done what was impossible for the law since it was weak because of selfishness. God condemned sin in the body by sending his own son to deal with the sin in the same body humans are corrupt who are controlled by sin he did this so that the righteous requirement of the law might be filled in us now the way of living is based on the spirit not based on selfishness people whose lives are based on selfishness think about selfish things but people whose lives are based off of on the spirit think about that are related to the spirit the Attitude that comes from selfishness leads to death, but the attitude that comes from the Spirit leads to life and peace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Tree.
Thank you, Beth. And Spencer, thanks for reading our scripture for us today. You did a great job, buddy. You did a great job. Thanks for serving God in that way. Would you join with me in a spirit of prayer? <clears throat> Almighty God, I pray now in these moments that through your word, our minds would be focused on the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit is calling us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a mom and a dad who invited the preacher over for dinner one evening. The preacher came over. They sat down in the living room and they started visiting. And all of a sudden, uh, their young son comes walking in. And he's holding up this little mouse. Holding it by the tail. And the father was appalled. He said, son, don't bring that in the house. And the little boy said, it's okay, dad. When I saw him on the back porch, I stomped him with my foot. I smashed him with the broom. I smashed him with the shovel until... And then the little boy noticed the preacher sitting on the couch. And he said, until God called him home. You know, we learn at a very young age how important it is to say the right things and do the right things and be the kind of people that the world around us will accept. We learn at a very young age, it's a part of our human nature to try to to try to impress the world around us in such a way that the world around us will give us what we want. And that the world around us would satisfy our desires of what we want from the world. It's a part of our human nature to want to please the world so that the world will please us. In this passage of scripture that Spencer read for us today, Paul is addressing this part of our human nature. He reminds us, he says, listen, don't focus your spirit. Don't focus your mind. Don't set your mind on the things of the flesh. Don't set your mind on things of the world. Because all that can lead to is selfishness. And all that can lead to is just looking out for ourselves and not caring about anyone else but ourselves. Wanting to get from the world what we want from the world. Paul reminds us in this passage that when we set our minds on the things of the world, then all we're going to be left to look forward to is death. He says, no, instead, set your minds on things of the Spirit. Set your minds on the things of the Spirit. Because to set your mind on things of the Spirit is to experience the true joy and the true peace that life can offer. What are those things of the Spirit that we should focus our minds upon those things of the Spirit that can bring us peace and joy. Well, all throughout the book of Romans, uh, Paul reminds us that there are basically three things that we should focus our minds upon if we want to be focused on the Spirit. There's three things we need to focus upon in order for our minds to be focused on the Spirit. First of all, Paul reminds us all throughout the book of Romans that in order for our minds to be focused on the Spirit, we must find a way to celebrate receiving as much as we celebrate giving. In order for our minds to be set on the Spirit, we need to find a way to celebrate receiving as much as we celebrate giving. Now, I'm sure some of you may be sitting there and saying, you know what? This guy, he's been our pastor now for two weeks and he's already losing his mind. 
What preacher have you ever heard say that giving wasn't that important? That's not what I'm saying. Bear with me on this. Bear with me on this. In order for our minds to be set on the Spirit, we have to celebrate receiving as much as we celebrate giving. I graduated from seminary in 1990. I graduated with my Master's of Divinity degree from the finest seminary in the country. Perkins School of Theology at SMU. All those other Methodist seminaries are second rate. I went to the best. I graduated in 1990 from Perkins School of Theology at SMU. And I accepted my first appointment. And I was the associate pastor of the Blackwater United Methodist Church in Central. Which is a suburb of Baton Rouge. I spent three years there as the associate pastor uh, at, um, at the Blackwater United Methodist Church. And then all of a sudden I got that phone call one day. That phone call that every newly ordained minister looks forward to. That phone call from a district superintendent ready to appoint you to your first church where you will be pastor in charge. My district superintendent called me and asked me if I would be open to going and becoming the new pastor at the St. Luke's United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge. And I was thrilled about that. I was thrilled about that. I couldn't wait to have my own church, you know. Something exciting about that. I got to St. Luke's and it wasn't long after I arrived that I was presented with, one of the, with something that had been on the minds of that church for months they wanted a new organ. And they needed a new organ. The one they had was old. Some of the keys wouldn't even work. Okay. The speaker uh, was old and it would pop every now and then. It sounded awful. They had been wanting a new organ for the longest time. The problem was the organ that they were going to... They wanted to get, it was a keyboard, kind of like this. It did what an organ does, but it did a lot more, you know, a lot of other things and all. The one that they wanted cost about $5,000, and that little church didn't have $5,000. They couldn't afford it. So I made this suggestion to the administrative council that we have a little mini campaign. That we ask people in the church to give a little bit over and above their regular giving to the new organ fund. And we announced it. We publicized it. People started getting excited about it. It didn't take us but two or three months to raise that $5,000. We bought that organ. And we were thrilled. I'll never forget it. It came in on a Monday. And the people brought it in and they installed it. And they hooked it into the sound system. And they hooked up all the speakers and everything. We had our new organ. And it happened that it just so happened that the next night was an administrative council meeting. So all the administrative council came. People who weren't even on the administrative council came because they knew that Florence Baker, our pianist and our choir director, was not going to be able to resist sitting down at that new organ and playing some things. And they wanted to hear it. So we had more people at the administrative council meeting that night than they ever had at that church. They were excited about that new organ. We listened to Florence play it. For a little while. And then we started our meeting. And as we were meeting there. We just stayed in the sanctuary. Uh, as we were meeting there. Someone suggested that now that we've got the new organ. And we'd worked so hard to raise the money for this new organ. Uh, now that we've got it. They said why don't we dedicate it this Sunday. And instead of doing all the other things that we do in worship. Why don't we just have a music service. So we can hear the new organ. We can sing some hymns and Florence can play some hymns. And all. Let's do nothing but music Sunday. And let's dedicate the new organ. And they said, are you okay with that, Michi? And I said, sure, I'm fine with that. I said, but there's one thing you need to know. I said, uh, a few weeks ago, I scheduled a baptism for this Sunday. We had this family who had... Uh, uh, the mom was a member of the church. The father had never set foot in that church before. But they had a little daughter. She was about a year or two old. And she wanted her little daughter baptized. But it was going to be much more than just that little child's baptism. You see, her father, who had never professed his faith in Jesus Christ, had never really been to church, wasn't a Christian, 
He and I had been meeting for a few weeks. And we had been talking about what that baptism to his child was going to mean. And his responsibility in that. We talked about what it meant to be a Christian. And he wanted to make his profession of faith in Jesus Christ that day. And he wanted to be baptized on the same day his daughter was baptized. Folks, we don't have those kinds of experiences a lot in Methodist churches, you know. I was excited about it. They were going to have family coming in from all over. This was going to be a huge day to see a precious little child of God baptized and her father at the same time making his profession of faith and being baptized. I told them about this. And I said, we're going to have to find a place in that service to do this baptism and to hear his profession of faith and to celebrate it. Outside of that, we can do music for the the rest of the time. I know y'all would probably like for me to take a break from preaching. That'll be good. But let's... Let's do the baptism and the profession of faith in the context of this musical service. And there was a lady there. I'm not going to say her name. She's no longer with us. God rest her soul. I loved her dearly. She became a very good friend. But she said something in that moment that absolutely shocked me. As we were talking about this and having to uh, incorporate this profession of faith and this baptism into this dedication for the new organ. She said, you know what? Me and she... A lot of people gave a lot of money for that new organ. And I was one of them. I think we ought to dedicate the organ on Sunday. And have that song service. She said, we can do that baptism and that profession of faith at another time. Folks, let me ask you a question. Let's tell the truth here. We see it all the time when we walk into churches, don't we? All those little brass plaques. All over everywhere. You see a brass plaque on the pulpit with the name of the person who donated the pulpit. You see the brass plaques on stained glass windows with the names of the people who donated those stained glass windows. You see the brass plaques on the baptismal font and the altar and the other things in the church. And they all have the names of the people who donated those items. And there is nothing wrong with that. Nothing in the world wrong with that. We should do that. We should acknowledge the giving of people to their church. Because the giving that we offer to the church, it's a part of our lifeblood. We can't be the church without it. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But let me ask you this. When was the last time you walked into any church, regardless of the denomination, and you saw a plaque on the baptismal font that listed all of the names of the people who were baptized there? When have you seen that? When was the last time you walked into a church and you saw a plaque on the altar rail that lists the names of the people who received the sacrament of Holy Communion for the first time there? And they knelt at that altar rail. When was the last time you saw a plaque in a church on the on the altar that listed the names of everyone who professed their faith in Jesus Christ at that altar. We don't see those, do we? We don't. And that's what Paul was meaning when he said, in order to focus our minds on things of the Spirit, we need to find a way to celebrate receiving as much as we celebrate giving. In order to set our minds on things of the Spirit, we got to find a way to celebrate just as much what we receive from God. As much as we celebrate what we give to God. Paul reminds us all throughout Romans that in order to set our minds on things of the Spirit, we've got to get physical with our faith. In order to set our minds on things of the Spirit, we have to get physical with our faith. As I told you last week in my opening sermon, uh, my mother was born and raised in Berlin, Germany. 
born and raised there. And as a child growing up, as a child and a young teenager, uh, me, uh, me and my family, we would always go to Berlin every two years to visit with my family there. And we would stay five or six weeks at a time, you know. And it was there where I kind of started to learn to speak German. And I got to where I could speak it fairly well. Of course, I had a Bernie's Louisiana dialect to it, you know. But, and it sounded strange, but I could speak the language pretty well. And not only did I learn to speak the German language in all those trips I made to, to Berlin as a child, I also got a great friend in all those trips. His name was Thomas Froham. Thomas's mother was my mother's best friend growing up. Thomas's mother was the, was the maid of honor in my mother's wedding. And my mother was her maid of honor in her wedding. Thomas and I were about the same age. And it just so happened that Thomas and his family lived in the same apartment building as my German grandmother, my Oma. And so when we would go back to visit, my mom and his mom would spend all this time together. Thomas and I became good friends. We'd spend every day together. We'd play. We'd walk across the, the street to the park. And we'd play soccer together and all that. Thomas and I became good friends. And every time I knew we were about to go to Berlin, I looked probably... Probably look more forward to spending time with Thomas than with my family, you know. It was great. It was great. Back in 1992, it had been years since I had been to Germany. Back in 1992, my German grandfather passed away. My opa passed away. And my dad couldn't go with my mom uh, back for the service. So I decided to take her back to Berlin. I decided to accompany her uh, back to Berlin for my opa's funeral. And while I was there, I got a chance to rekindle that friendship that I had with Thomas. We spent a number of days together. We were there, my mom, my mom and I, we were there for three or four weeks. And um, we had a chance to spend a lot of time together. And it was fascinating. Because you see, Thomas got his law degree in international law. From Oxford University in England. That's a big deal. Because Oxford's a pretty prestigious school. And Thomas had, uh, uh, Thomas's career, he was, the pro he was a prosecutor for the West German government. He was a prosecutor. And his assignment was to prosecute folks from East Berlin and East Germany who had committed civil rights and human rights abuses. As a member of the Communist Party. A few years earlier, you know, the wall had gone down. And there was no longer West Berlin and East Berlin. And he was responsible for, uh, uh, for uh, investigating and prosecuting those folks who were a part of the Communist Party. And had carried out these civil rights abuses. His stories were fascinating. And I just loved sitting there listening to all of it. That uh, he was telling me. He told me one day. He said you know what. He goes. I know a man and a woman. I investigated him. He was a member of the communist party. He was a member of the government. Uh, in East Berlin. He's got an incredible story to tell. Would you like to go visit with him? I said oh I would love to visit with him. I would love to hear his story. He wasn't found guilty of any of the civil rights stuff. Or the human rights stuff. But, but he had been a part of that, that government. That communist government of East Berlin. So we went to this man's apartment and we sat down in his living room and uh, he started telling his story. And of course, it had been years since I had spoke German fluently, you know, and I was having a little trouble understanding what he was saying. So Thomas was uh, interpreting it for me and we listened to his story. And then when it came time to leave, I stood up and I was going to impress the man. I needed to go to the bathroom. I need to go to the bathroom. So I stood up and I asked him in German if he would show me where his bathroom was. I asked him in German. And all of a sudden he looked at me with this strange look on his face. And he started talking to Thomas. And Thomas started laughing. And I said, what's so funny? And Thomas said, you just asked this man if he would like to come with you to the bathroom. <laughs> and he's not sure what to think about that. You know, friends, you've heard that old saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. If you don't use it, you lose it. 
You know? And not only is that true for another language, not only is it true for vacation time uh, at work, not only is it true for um, perishable foods that are in our refrigerator, it's true in our faith as well. It's very true in our faith. If we don't use our faith, we can lose our faith. If we don't use our faith to serve God, and if we don't use our faith to serve the needs of others with the grace and love of Christ, then we can lose our faith. The founder of Methodism, John Wesley, said it best. He said, faith without works is a dead faith. Faith without works is a dead faith. Faith. In order for us to focus our mind on things of the Spirit, we need to focus our minds on getting physical with our faith. And finally, throughout Romans, Paul reminds us that in order to focus our minds on things of the Spirit, we should focus our minds on worship. I want to give you a little homework assignment here today. I know folks don't like to come to church and get homework. But I want to give you some homework today. It's not that hard. But when you get home today, I want you to look up the word worship in a dictionary. I want you to look up the word worship in a dictionary. And what you're going to find is that the word worship in the dictionary falls right between the words worse and worst. You look it up when you get home. The word worship falls right between the words worse and worst. And I think there's a message in that. I think there's a message in that. Worship is that time when we come together and we praise and we glorify God. Worship is a time for us to come together and experience the power and the presence of God in our lives. Worship is a time where we come together to pray and to hear God's word. To spend time in fellowship with other believers. That's what we do in worship. And what we may need to remember is this. Sometimes worship. Many times it's worship. That praising and glorifying God. Feeling God's presence. Being surrounded by fellow believers. Praying and, and hearing God's word. Sometimes that worship might just be the only thing that stands between things in life going from worse... To worst. Paul said, don't set your minds on the things of the flesh. Don't focus on your own selfish desires and what the world can offer you. Because all you're going to be left to look forward to is death. He said, no, instead, focus your mind on things of the spirit. Focus your minds on celebrating receiving as much as you celebrate giving. Focus your minds on getting physical with your faith. Focus your minds on worship. Because when you do that. You can find the peace. And the joy. And the hope. That comes with being a child of God. Where is our mindset today? Where is our mindset today? Is it on things of the world? Or things of the spirit? With that question in mind. I'd like for us to turn to God now. In prayer. So let's pray together. Almighty God, in these moments, we confess that sometimes we become far too focused on our selfish desires and our selfish needs. We turn away from focusing our mind on what it means to be one of your children. 
what it means to be a disciple of Christ. We pray in these moments, oh God, that you would inspire us again to focus our minds on the things of the Spirit. As we give to you our very best, help us to also take the time to praise and glorify you for what you have given to us. Help us to use our faith to reach out in service and in love to you and to other people. Help us, help us to make worship a priority in our lives so that we can experience the joy and the peace you offer us as only you can offer it. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Friends, our closing song is Spirit of the Living God. And we're going to stand together. We're going to join in singing this song. We're going to sing through it twice. And if you are here today and you have not professed your faith in Jesus Christ, you would like to become a Christian, I want to invite you to come forward as we sing. If you're here today and you would like to unite with this congregation, I want to invite you to come forward as we sing. But for all of us who are here today, let us use this time to focus our minds on the things of the Spirit so that we can experience all of the joy and the peace that God is ready to offer us. Let's stand together as we join in singing. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, speak. Thank you for being here today. And as we leave here today, I hope we leave here with our minds set on God. And our minds set on those things of the Spirit. And as we leave here today, to you, my brothers and my sisters in Christ, go in peace. Sin no more. Love God. And serve God's people. And let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.